Right, here we are. Yes, I'm seeing um, an, an awful lot of faces. Uh, right, hello everyone. Welcome to um, the, uh, this very special event by the Young Fabians um, in association with the Young Fabians BAME Advocacy Group. Uh, my name is Henry. I am the co-chair of the Young Fabians BAME Advocacy Group alongside uh, my friend Angeli uh, Mookie, uh, who is also on this call here. Um, all of you are just going to be muted just to begin with, I'm afraid, and we're not, we're not going to be able to um, 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 unmute you for, uh, for the time being. Uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll be asking uh, David Treisman here, who's very uh, kindly agreed to uh, be here for this event. Uh, I'll be asking him a few questions uh, over, the course of, uh, uh, over the course of the evening. We'll start with uh, some opening remarks from David about the future of the Labour Party and then move on to some questions from me. And then for the last half hour or so, then we should be able to open it up to some audience questions. Um, in terms of um, any questions that you guys would like to ask, you can obviously feel free to send me a, a message here on Zoom um, as to um, you know, if you'd like to be asking a question, I'll try and keep a note of them so that we can go to you and unmute your mic to ask those questions uh, later in the evening. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, uh, David, would you like to make your opening remarks to kick us off? Okay, Henry, and uh, let me apologise to everybody for how long it took to get in. I Not think uh, it's, pro it's probably a kind of a, an electronic miracle that we get going at all, but uh, <laughs> It's very, very good to join you and thank you for inviting me. I, I imagine everybody who's been asked about the future of the Labour Party in the last 20 years has said we're at an inflection point and we obviously are. Yes. Um, I'm speaking to everybody from Camden in uh, Keir Starmer's constituency. I have to tell you that I don't even get a vote in a general election. There's uh, several categories of people who don't get votes, people who are certified and in long-term um, uh, psychiatric hospitals, people who are guests of Her Majesty in her prisons and uh, members of the House of Lords. We don't get a vote, but Keir would be my MP. And Keir has been somebody who I supported for the nomination in the constituency and I've supported the whole way through this leadership campaign. And so I start by speaking with rather more optimism than I felt for probably um, the last five years, not just the last three and a half, but probably the last five years. And I, I think that um, the, the way in which we could conceive of our party beginning to develop again and beginning to grow again after a period in which it was really going backwards, whatever people say about modest election successes, the truth was we were doing nothing new and nothing that was really likely to win an election. The last election was the starkest demonstration of that. I've always thought that politics, uh, more than anything else, is a conversation. What you try to do is you try to earn the right to be listened to by a people who don't have to listen to you at all if they don't want. Uh, and the only way you can earn the right to have people listen to you is if you listen to them. And I believe that in the years in which we were successful, and I took um, major roles as general secretary in the elections in 2001 and 2005, was to understand some of the fundamentals that people really, really were concerned with. We, we learned by listening to them. We learned uh, a whole lot of stuff, uh, stuff about the ways in which people's aspirations for themselves and their families were maturing. And that wasn't just our traditional supporters, because people who run very small businesses or some people in quite big businesses also have aspirations. And they often have aspirations which are to do with social justice. They're not all Victorian mill owners and so on. And when you begin to talk to them, you can see that they've got uh, quite a lot of common ground. Secondly, there was um, a lot of stuff we learned, and I think it's still out there today, about what is fair, what fairness is. If ever we had to learn it again in a very stark way, this uh, coronavirus period is telling us about what's fair. The people who didn't seem terribly important compared with the captains of industry now turn out to be the most important people in our lives. Indeed, we're alive because they keep us alive. And I mean bin men just as much as I mean people working in the health service. The people who keep the whole of the fabric going in the health service preeminently. We learn quite a lot about fairness around things which people don't really think about all that much anymore because they're kind of commonplace. The legislation which introduced whistleblowing, mm. which has had a profound effect on making sure that abuses don't happen in the same way. 
And I could go right through a lot of things, the uh, way in which investments in the health service and in education, the way in which we looked at child benefit, they were all to do with giving people a proper start, being fair, and making sure that their aspirations had a reasonable chance of being met. And that's where we are again today. There are new versions of it. I'm not pretending that you could just dust down and roll out the old things, but the fundamental themes, the real values are where the Labour Party will always build and outbuild any Conservative government ever. No Conservative government will ever take those things as seriously. And even if they pay lip service to them, you know perfectly well that they're not going to do them. They can say anything they want about protective clothing. I doubt there's a person in the country who believes that they're actually sourcing it for people in the health service because they started off by believing everybody should get this damned virus and that we should get herd immunity and now it's too late for them to catch up. They weren't telling the truth from the beginning. So it's a conversation, it's a right to earn the right to be listened to mm. and to do it by, um, by getting back to some of the things which were the fundamental guides to building success. And I just want to say a couple of words and then I'm going to begin to wrap up and give everybody else a chance but I want to say a couple of words about building success. Countries are not completely homogeneous, they may have some values in common but there are lots of different interests in every country and if you're going to build success you have to bring together a number of those interests and begin to get people to cooperate around those interests. It means making alliances with people you don't always think are your natural allies. We learned that, curiously enough, those of us who were sent across to take part in Bill Clinton's first campaign, mm. but actually it then took root in our own party. We learned that um, whilst there's sometimes an appetite to be very secretive, the reality today, with everything on display, and particularly with social media, is that there are no secrets. You've got to be out there and you've got to be telling the truth properly about the values. You've got to be prepared to share knowledge because people in many ways are getting smarter and have access to a great deal more knowledge and that's become vital because otherwise fake news and total lies and we're seeing another that from the government uh, in these last weeks total lies begin to have the semblance of reality and that's dangerous and we can't just go out there anymore and we can't redevelop the success of our party by just saying we're the best which was kind of what we did in the last election that's not a viable proposition. You've got to say, rather, this is what we're going to do and then do it and not be secretive about the way in which you're going to do it. Mm. Saying you're the best is not the same. And uh, we will probably, in the light of that, have to make a lot more use of the widespread availability of information and the ability to look at that information through artificial intelligence. I don't keep dropping IT sort of phrases and that's not really my point. But if we're really going to learn about health, we're going to have to do it with the most sophisticated methods that are available to us. Because our job in getting listened to is to tell people that we've understood what's happening to them and that we can respond to it. Now, that might be regarded as, as modernity, but um, I don't know whether it's modernity or not. And I don't candidly care. What I do care about is that uh, the party that could do the New Deal could bring about close to full employment, working tax credits, the minimum wage, will find the methods again for doing those things in a modern setting, and they'll find it by using intellect, really using our minds very, very hard, listening to people, learning from people, and being prepared to enter into a dialogue in which they tell us as much as we want to try and tell them. It's an ex exchange, it's a shared experience. That's our way forward. Anything else, going out with tablets of stone, whether, well, we actually did that, of course, but going out with tablets of stone with Ed Miliband or the unvarnished truth about socialism with Corbyn, all of that is historic and it should be left where it's uh, supposed to be. It's political anthropology. Right. Uh, thank you very much for all of that, David. I think that the main question that springs to, uh, to mind from what you were saying there. Uh, now, you very publicly left the Labour Party in July of last year, or resigned the whip at least, alongside Lord Darcy and Lord uh, Toomba. Can I take it from uh, what you're saying there, then, that you've since rejoined? 
Well, I never left the party, but I refused to accept the whip that was being dictated by Corbyn because right. I thought that almost everything he said was not something that I could support. I, I, I am considering actively taking the whip again, but I've got one other test, which I believe that um, Keir will, will, will pass. But it, And I'm not being sort of sitting in judgment, but to me it's an existential matter. Will he put onto our benches some of the anti-Semites who've been nominated for peerages? Because I would find it very hard to sit alongside those people. I know at first hand they're anti-Semites. And for me, one of the most fundamental moral tests is whether we deal with that issue. Right. I see what you mean. So I think then just um, off the back of that then, so you've, you've talked about sort of different t- tests that, that you have uh, for care and mm-hmm. You know, you're clearly very impressed by Keir. Um, I suppose I just wanted to ask you in, um, in general then what it is about Keir's campaign and Keir himself that has impressed you over the course of the last few months. Well, t- to be really honest with you, Henry, I wasn't impressed by the campaigns um, a lot anyway, but I wasn't overly impressed by Keir's campaign. <laughs> I thought that he was doing the job which he politically had, I guess, thought was necessary to win the vote among the current Labour Party and not have um, significant backlash from from the unions. Mm. So he did what he needed to do. But you couldn't really think of going into government without reaching out much, much more widely than that. Sure. And I believe he's capable of that. For a start, he's extremely thoughtful and meticulous in detail. Secondly, he's got very, very good ethics, very good values. And that, I think, is very important. And so did some of the other candidates as well one or two of the other candidates I'm not um, disparaging them at all but Keir certainly does have those things and I think that he is capable of um, listening to people as I was saying and understanding what it is they want to talk about now not everybody does that some people go out and preach to everybody some people listen to them and then have a conversation with them and he does that and Lisa would have done that as well by the way I you know to to think of another candidate I thought was very impressive in many ways. But he will do that, and he will bring the party together. And I think that he will uh, do something else which is very, very seriously needed, and that is to take the different sorts of groups in the party, whether they're men or women, or they've got different sexuality, and he will take that really seriously, not just as a verbal code for being on the right side of things, but actually in doing it. Right. Um, you mentioned Lisa Nandy there. Now, obviously, she's been made Chair of Foreign Secretary. And I wanted to ask you, based on your experience, because I know that you used to be our Shadow Spokesperson in the Lords for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, uh, whether you feel that so far, I know obviously it's early days, whether you feel that Keir and Lisa have struck the right tone on foreign policy? Good, well, it's a very good question. When I was, I was um, Foreign Minister in, uh, in the Blair government. It is very early days and I think that one of the things that would be particularly useful would be for Lisa to talk to some of the people who served in the Foreign Office as I did uh, and to begin to get onto a more uh, solid footing. One of the things that's happened in the Corbyn years is that we, we struck foreign policy postures and we frequently changed our policy very very rapidly. Uh, we, we had, in one month, three totally different policies on the Middle East. Now, whether, that, whether one of them was right or not is really not my point. The point is you can't deal with ambassadors and people from other countries if they don't know where the hell you're coming from. So I think that uh, a lot of us will be very eager to work with Lisa. We'll, she, she will be the shadow foreign secretary and she'll take her own decisions. But I'd like to feel that she had a pool of experience of dealing with the uh, with the international community mm. that was really available to her and she could use it any day and every moment she wanted. Mm. Perfect, thank you very much. So alongside um, you resigning the whip you know, under Corbyn, um, Lord Darcy and Lord Thunberg um, resigned as well. Do you happen to know whether or not they're considering taking the whip back up? Uh, I don't. Uh, I haven't uh, talked to them about it, largely because the last uh, last few weeks have been heavily involved in trying to source stuff for the NHS from um, the international contacts that mm. managed to develop when I was in the Foreign Office. Um, 
I, I would think that they are, they are very rational people and they probably are thinking of doing that. Um, they, it, it would be very good if they did because they're both tremendous people. Uh, I served in government with Aradazi. He was um, health minister. Mm. Uh, he never gave up being a top flight surgeon, by the way. He did a yeah. deal with Gordon Brown that he could spend two days a week uh, being a surgeon. He's probably one of the most eminent surgeons in this mm. country. And uh, I know that he felt that the way Jewish people were being treated in the party was very, very much the same way that his people have been treated in Turkey. Mm. And he, he's... He's not Jewish, but his his principles shone through. Yeah. I can only say it that way. Well, because he's got those principles and because they will shine through, mm. I think he must be considering it the same way that I am. You've mentioned the way that Jewish people have been treated, and obviously our yeah, anti-Semitism was a big part of why you know why you and Lord Darcy resigned the whip. I suppose the question then is, what do you think was what broke the camel's back? Because I know that you stayed and continued taking the whip for quite a while into Corbyn's leadership and so I suppose the question is what do you think was the straw that kind of broke the camel's back for for you and what do you think that is that Keir needs to do to be able to win back the trust of the Jewish community both at large and within the Labour Party? Well the, in a way the key things for me were the ways that I came to learn that people who worked for the party some of whom had worked for me when I was general secretary worked with me when I was general secretary mm -hmm the way they'd been treated when they tried to deal with the problem. Right. Uh, the, people, the people who were at their wit's end, who were considering suicide, for God's sake. I mean, you know, we were, we were talking about fantastic people who worked for the party, often for a very, very long time. Some younger people who'd thrown themselves in with huge energy, only to be very disappointed. Um, one or two things which I guess are, are personal. You know, so every so often somebody says to me, is it because I'm Jewish and because I don't like, uh, hearing Israel attacked. Actually, if anybody ever heard me at the dispatch box, they would know that I was critical of any international law breaking. Israel, absolutely. Yeah. Netanyahu, absolutely. No, no difference to me. The principle on international law is the same. What really uh, got me was, was a, a group of people uh, asking me why I was so opposed to Brexit. Was it because I was looking after my friends, the Rothschilds? Oh, God. Yeah, well, you know, and th there's a moment where you, where you say, actually, this could be 1934. Mm. If people are really, the, the Jewish conspiracy, the bankers and so on. I mean, I, don't, I, I felt that it got to a point where um, it needed to change radically. Now, I think Keir's got the will to do that, but he's got a real difficulty, which I, I would like to help him overcome, but he's got a real difficulty. During the Corbyn years, the machinery got taken to pieces. Mm. Loads of good people were driven out. People running regions, doing the, the really difficult day-by-day -day job for the party. They're not there anymore. Now, I tell you, it's no small thing to reconstruct an organisation the size of the Labour Party, mm. which based, is based on so many volunteers, let alone a relatively small number of staff. So he may be at the beginning pulling on levers which are not cabled to anything at the other end. Mm. He's going to have a real job. Now, it's up to us, I think, to help. But I think he's going to have to do that. And he's going to have to take head on the really egregious examples of, uh, of uh, what is just a, a very acute form of racism that happens to be directed at Jewish people. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, that's a uh, yeah, really thoughtful response and good to, good to hear from you on that. I suppose there's uh, some comparisons there, actually, in Keir's talking about the notion of professionalising the party and what you sort of set out to do as general secretary in terms of you know, organising the party's finances, um, you know, moving us to have a proper HQ, etc. And so I wonder if there's any particular advice from that kind of organisational point of view that you would perhaps give Keir you know, in terms of professionalising the party and making sure that we're, you know, that we're ready to be an effective opposition um, yeah, from, that, from that point of view. Well, the first thing is that um, whilst the party is not a business, it's got to run with reasonably business-like precision. Mm. You can't constantly be in debt. I had, at the beginning of the time I was General Secretary, I had a couple of months where our bank, which was supposed to be sympathetic, came in and said they weren't going to pay the staff their wages. And I said, oh, you know, the, the damage that will be caused was enormous, but the extent of the overdraft and the... Uh, the fact that we had no means of dealing with it, 
I could kind of understand where they were coming from, disappointed as I was. So it's got to be business-like. It's got to be run in a way which means we've got um, diverse sources of income. It can't be one powerful union. It can't be, I mean, it never really was the big uh, private donors. I can't ever remember any of them asking for anything. I can actually remember some of the unions asking for things, but I can't remember the big private donors asking for things. But in any event, you want a mix of all of the members putting their hands in their pockets because because for some people a pensioner a couple of quid is a very very big investment from their point of view you want some of the people who who are fortunate enough to be very wealthy to make a contribution you certainly want the unions to make regular contributions and without strings and you need a business plan which does it and mm. your business plan has got to be um, modest about the resources when you haven't got a lot of money to spend and build so that you can spend the money when you really have to, particularly in the major campaigns. Tony Blair used to describe it as trying to run a big tent. Mm. And it was a big tent in the sense that we had people, I suppose I'm one of them, who'd run big businesses. And that was, um, that was not everybody's taste, I, I understand that, but I thought it was a, an advantage. Uh, I didn't want to own money on the building. I didn't want to rent roll to somebody owning a huge property on the, uh, on the side of the River Thames. I didn't want all the things that you wouldn't do in a business, mm. not because I wanted it to be a business, but because I wanted the money for the campaigning and for the work I think the Labour Party really does. Um, I want to go back just a little bit, David, because um, yeah, I've been d uh, doing some research into you uh, from before you were general secretary and so, uh, you know, and uh, some of your early days. And so I'm curious a bit about um, how you got into politics in the first instance and um, sort of you know student activism and things like that. Well, I, I joined the Labour Party when I was 15 and I lied and said I was 16. <laughs> and uh, my parents were appalled because they were from the old East End Jewish communist families, <laughs> of, of whom, because there was even a, a parliamentary seat at one time in the East End, which was held by the Communist Party. I mean, it sounds extraordinary now, but there we are. Uh, I was very active in it. I was, um, when I arrived at university, I was uh, still absolutely solidly in the Labour Party. The, the, student, the student activism was probably more about uh, the Vietnam War and mm. opposition to the Vietnam War than it was about anything else. Uh, and, and I must say that I was appalled by the fact that one of our own uh, science institutions, Porton Down, was making rice crop poisons, which the Americans were dropping in Vietnam. And so I, that's what actually brought me into the student movement more mm. than anything else. I just, I just thought this is... This is, uh, this is not bearable. Mm. Civilised people can't do this. Um, I spent a brief period, uh, as a number of people did, when the Euro communists were uh, beginning to develop and the feminist movement and, uh, and a lot of the other cultural movements um, really formed what became the olive tree movement in Italy. And I and another economist from Cambridge were helping to advise one of the uh, Italian regions on mm. the structure of their economy. But when I look around the people who later became uh, the, the, the builders of new labour, there were, of course, a whole bunch of us who'd been through the same history and at the same time. John Reed, a number of people who didn't come out quite so publicly, and I won't, I won't name them today because <laughs> they may thank me for it. But, but I looked at... Um, I looked at the first new Labour cabinet and the second new Labour cabinet, and there were half a dozen people I'd knew, known who'd gone through the same journey. But it became very, I mean, I should say, Henry, it became very clear very quickly. You know, it didn't take us very long before we realised that we might, we might be trying to build an alliance of different kinds of progressive movements, but the truth is it would never, ever uh, take any part in government in this country with the mm. consequence it would never do anything for anybody right. it's luxuriating it but you do nothing mm. and I, I think that um, all, all the people I'm very grateful for having worked with are all doers mm. 
No, absolutely. Um, I suppose also part of the reason I wanted to bring that up is that I know you said that the, primarily your student activism was all to do with the Vietnam War, but I also read somewhere, and I'd like to ask whether or not this is actually the case, that, um, that at Essex University where you attended, at one point Enoch Powell uh, was invited by the Conservative Association and that you and a few other student activists attended the meeting and that you yelled that he was a racist sod. Uh, no, actually, maybe I should have, but um, <laughs> what happened was one one guy who, uh, my memory is, was from the SWP, mm. came extremely animated and wouldn't stop screaming and shouting and, and went forward to where Enoch Powell was speaking with a grapefruit with a, a, a sort of a lit fuse sticking out of it. And <laughs> the grapefruit was painted black and so on. Anyway, um, the, the, the rest of us, uh, I think, were they're not just to listen in a passive way. I've no doubt, you know, people would have called out and so on. I, as it happens, I didn't in the period he was there, but I think that um, there, there was a strong view that uh, people should take things on and debate them. Mm. The, the whole notion of there being a really rigorous debate was something which was a hallmark of what happened at the LSE, uh, at Essex and, and, and at the Sorbonne and, and other places. It wasn't that people being silenced, actually. Mm. It was that really fierce arguments about politics and ideology broke out in places that didn't normally have fierce arguments. Mm. They were terribly polite. <laughs> Uh, but thank you. Yeah. And in fact, I think that that's something that you probably took through largely into being General Secretary of the Labour Party as well. I remember reading interviews with you about how but, you, know, you were very keen, particularly at the, I think, the 2002 party conference to promote debate over you know, the Iraq war and things like that. Um, mm. And so I also remember that you were made a sort of a universities and students minister in the, sort of the latter days of, of the last Labour government. So I suppose uh, potentially a slightly cheeky question. But uh, I've got a quote from you here from around that time, um, which is uh, <laughs> about students. Uh, yeah, students are among the best place to tell government what's going right in the system and what needs to be done better. So uh, in that vein, I know that you are a massive fan of the Corbyn years and things like that, but are you in favour of abolishing tuition fees? Well, I, I, I'm not sure it's entirely possible to abolish them completely because I, I, I honestly don't know how university finances are going to stack up mm. but they're massively too high and if what you're saying is that everybody should make a, if the argument was everybody should make a fair contribution mm. then i can tell you i think the fair contribution is at a pretty low level mm. if it exists at all one of the things i do know is that the country as a whole has a huge advantage in teaching people to be doctors and mm. and all those i mean that's a huge social wealth that we create mm. we've got businesses that are reliant on the intellectual power of the people it employ of the, the people they employ i cannot see why an element of corporation tax should not help repay that because broadly speaking it's not paid for by business mm. now i'm not talking about jacking things up a great deal and i can think of other things i mean in some countries uh, i discussed this with one of the one of the big uh, reviews of universities uh, you could have a form of bond to which companies needed to subscribe through their corporation tax a part of their corporation tax and through which other to which others could uh, subscribe which was hypothecated would have to be spent on universities you couldn't just take it in and then spend it on potholes or, or something else yeah. and so I, I suppose what I'm saying, Henry, is that I think that you can devise me, ways which are fairer and mm -hmm. which possibly say, well, actually, uh, a graduate will, uh, over the course of their working life, will earn a lot more than other people. Mm -hmm. Working people who are repairing the potholes are in part paying for them. You know, there's, there, there could be a little bit more equity. Right. But I think the, the whole debt issue at the moment is obscene. Mm, no, absolutely. I suppose there's uh, there's also an element that I'm wondering, you know, obviously I know that you weren't particularly enamoured of the Corbyn years and things like that, but whether you think that there is, um, you know, whether you think that Keir was, obviously, uh, uh, you know, as you've said before, then Keir was very much uh, directing his campaign towards the party membership rather than reaching outwards. But do you think that there's a place for the sort of, you know, the sort of policy platform that he was broadly going for uh, during that leadership campaign? And do you think that that's an appropriate basis to build from, at least, 
uh, going forward for the Labour Party. Well, there, there are certainly elements of it that um, that can be built uh, on. And, you know, if you take the areas where I'm liable to have the most differences with Corbyn on economic policy, mm. uh, there are certainly some areas in which I think it's more or less indispensable that the state has a central role in in uh, in provision. I, I, I can't imagine a more stupid system than the break up and the sell off of the railways. I mean, I, it, it is it is a motor for total inefficiency and complete frustration of the people who are supposed to be the kings in this business, which that's the consumers, the people who buy their tickets and get on the trains mm -hmm. well, if they can find them in the north of England. Uh, you, what you've got is um, some things that would be very, very much better run centrally and our European partners capitalist or not have understood that from day one they've ne they've never had any doubt about it uh, but there are there were a raft of other things where i think the uh, policies were absolutely incredible mm. a modern economy however efficient could not do them some of them i think were still in Keir's um in in his uh golf club he was getting them out and and uh and still saying them but i don't believe for a second that some of them could be done in government if and it's a big important if if you really think that to get into government you've got to build coalitions across quite broad groups of people in this case actually in the last election even the people who you may think would have liked the idea um, people in traditional working class constituencies thought it was as crazy as anybody else did. Mm. Do you think that there's an element that, um, that a part of that is to do with who the messenger was, though, as well, in terms of, you know, that Keir is potentially more attractive um, centre forward in that sense, and that there are some policies for which, you know, we, we, we get a better hearing from, depending on who is actually at the top. And the Jeremy Corbyn, with you know all the sort of baggage that that's involved, and yeah, you know, and you know the sort of failures of party management and uh, over anti-Semitism and what have you, whether that contributes to not getting a fair hearing on some other policies. Well, that's possibly true. Um, he, he wasn't always the best advocate to hear, and he wasn't going to be listened to by the media. And and I think there's a lot of truth. I don't think it was them that undermined him. I think he undermined himself, but yeah, nonetheless. Sure. Nonetheless, uh, I, I can understand the point. But you know, you raise a question as you were asking it, it made me just kind of smile because the very first Labour leader I did any work with was Michael Foote. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, no, it's Harold Wilson. I'm very, very old. But it's Harold Wilson. But, but with Michael Foote, he was one of the most engaging people you could ever meet. He was a great polymath. I mean, if you wanted to sit and talk to him about Ruskin or about uh, whatever novel was uh, currently popular he'd read it he knew about it he could he would he had a phenomenal breadth and he was very charming and very very approachable mm. but he never came up with an economic policy that anybody could live with so even if he had a much more charming person doing it mm. and somebody who people warmed to and they did i mean you know there, there'd be the detractors and stuff but generally people warmed to michael you know what was not to like about the man mm. but the policies were crackers Right. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I've, I've stayed off the subject of football uh, for the most part during this, uh, but which I, I apologise for. I know that this, um, you know, that, uh, that as former chairman of the FA, that football is a particular passion of yours. And I know that um, when David Lammy was made, was made Shadow Justice Secretary recently, that you tweeted to him that, you know, it was a w victory for Tottenham. Um, but... Um, but so I, I did want to touch upon uh, one thing in relation to football and uh, anti-racist activism. Now, I noticed that uh, when you were chair of the FA, then you were quite involved at points with show races in the red card. Uh, and they were very much promoting uh, your bid for England to host the 2018 FIFA World Cup. I wondered if you were aware of the controversy around Ken Loach being a judge for the schools competition that show races in the red card were holding and what you thought of that. I probably ought to have known that he was, but I didn't. And um, so, you know, I apologise if I should have known, but I, I, didn't. I just, because you can't keep track of no, all absolutely. the things that are happening in football at any one time. What what I felt very determined about and uh, worked very closely with, um, w with a number of people 
uh, Herman Oosley in particular, for example, who's also in the House of Lords and, and has had an amazing, uh, amazing impact on uh, anti-racism in football, was that there were undercurrents. Everybody kept saying they're going away, and I was saying, well, they're not going away. Um, the the uh, the things that are said about gay people in a dressing room are utterly unacceptable. About black people and people of colour, absolutely unacceptable. The ways in which uh, people, even in, in a period when we were beginning to see the first really impressive televised women's football, the people who were becoming the, the uh, assistant referees and then the referees who happened to be women, you didn't have to travel very far. And mm. even in the leadership of the FA, they often spoke to each other as though they were in one of those dressing rooms at half time. And I wasn't going to, I don't want to live with it. I mean, it's, it's simple, really. You know, it's right, rather like finding the level of corruption in FIFA. You, 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 at the end of it, you get up and you look at yourself in the bathroom mirror in the morning and you say, do I want to live? Um, is that who I am? And do I want to live with this? Mm. And I couldn't and I wouldn't. We'll just have one more question from me and then I think we'll try and throw open to um, you know, to everyone else who's been waiting very patiently. So just on the subject of um, anti-racism in general, now I'm very careful that I don't want to delve too far into this, because, uh, but, you know, uh, but the leaked report that came out recently uh, into anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, which also spoke uh, you know, of uh, examples of racism, you know, of other forms of racism against uh, black and minority ethnic people within the party, you know, uh, for, from certain members of staff and things like that. And, you know, the failures by the party as well to redact um, the names of individual party members who've made complaints. And I just wondered whether or not you, you know, what views you have about um, whether perhaps that this is a watershed moment that gives Keir an opportunity to have a clean slate, you know, regardless of any sort of factions or anything like that, uh, but to really clean up our act as a Labour Party. Because I do remember uh, a lot of uh, friends of mine, people of colour, who were saying that anti-Semitism isn't the only issue of racism within the Labour Party, that they've very much, you know, experienced it in other ways. And if anything, something that they were concerned about and worried about is that because of the level of attention that anti-Semitism was rightly getting uh, in the press and in the media, that they didn't really feel able to speak up about some of their own experiences because they didn't want to feel as if or be accused as if they were engaging in any kind of whataboutery, I guess. And so I wonder if you think that this presents a good opportunity to care, you know, regardless of positions beforehand in the party, regardless of service to the party, if it gives Keir an opportunity, this, uh, this leaked report, once it's been investigated, to, you know, to have a clear out and a clean slate? Well, Keir is, um, well, I was going to say above everything else, but it's not true. It wouldn't be above everything else, but it's very prominent in his makeup. He's a very forensic man. Mm. He's, um, he's used to dealing with thing in, things in a very forensic way. And I just hope he will take the opportunity that you've described. I, I can't really add to your words. I agree with the sentiment that's in them. Uh, if, these, uh, if these stains are on us for any reason, they've got to be dealt with. Mm. The Labour Party will never, ever be an authentic organisation if it's prepared to shield that kind of behaviour assuming that the investigation he does demonstrates the truth of it. I mean, I, I yeah. haven't read it, I haven't seen it. No, all. Absolutely. I've seen bits quoted, of course, sure. but the whole 800 pages has never come. And, and, and there is a sense that in some ways, bits of the report are potentially a bit partisan, but... Um, could, be. could be, but, but you know, it, it is a new phase. He's got the drive. He's certainly got the, um, the, the intellectual take on things, which gives him the chance to do it. And I believe, if I look at the other people around who are past general secretaries, Margaret Madonna, um, Ray Collins, Larry Whitty, Tom Sawyer, he, he will have absolute support in doing that. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I think um, that's enough chatter from just uh, just me. So I think we probably ought to throw it open to audience questions. Um, I've got a couple of people who have expressed interest in asking questions. Uh, Matthew Howard, I've got a question from you here. Would you like to ask that yourself? How will the coronavirus impact Labour's policy making in the current years, and does it validate the need for a universal basic income? Thank you. 
Uh, well, let me start with the second bit first. I think it's an extremely powerful argument for, for uh, an income that is set in that way. There are so many examples at the moment of the inequalities that this virus has demonstrated. Uh, I, I live in, uh, you know, in pretty comfortable surroundings. I've got to be straightforward about it. I've got about five computers in the house because of the different things I do. I know people are living in tiny flats. The schools are saying to the, they're often no computers at all. The schools are saying, you know, get all your kids on a computer. Well, there are three people, often three kids, you know, and three, there aren't three computers, even if there's one. There's the, the differences in what people have available to them, I think, are really, really serious, Matthew. And I, I think that it's a very strong argument. The way in which I think it will change us, because I think it will change us, is it will mean that um, there'll be a lot more dialogue using all kinds of means to have dialogue so that you and I and others can talk to people, whether they're at the northern end of Scotland or in the French Socialist Party or whatever, we'll, we will have those opportunities and those, this country needs a new dose of internationalism. That's quite clear to me. We've turned our backs on it in a bad way. We will have very, very much higher regard, regard for the people who keep our society afloat. That will be, I think, something which will not go away. And I think that we will look at some of the people who probably are exploiting these circumstances in uh, financial ways and will say we're not prepared to live with their ethics anymore. So I think that we will, um, we, we will and we should rebalance. i just add one more point. If we're going to do that, I think it's going to be absolutely critical that we don't allow our leading politicians to lie to us all the time. And I'm afraid the, uh, the last weeks have just, I'm not, it's not just in this country, of course, I mean, there are even worse examples in Donald Trump, but we cannot have people who lie about whether they're providing protective clothing to people in the NHS or that the whole thing will go away in 12 weeks or all the kind of rubbish we've heard. Let's be intolerant of liars as well as we come out of this. Absolutely. I just want to ask a quick follow up question on that subject, actually, you know, to do with our policy making in the future and coronavirus. Uh, now, obviously, for very necessary reasons, then there's been a lot of restrictions been put in place uh, as ways of containing the virus uh, in many countries in terms of people coming in and out of various countries. Uh, but do you think that there's a real risk that um, anti migrant sentiment? could be increased um, in the aftermath of, you know, uh, of when we come out the other side of this? And what can we do about it? It, it, it could. And um, because we've made very, very little, really, of the contribution that migrants have made to our country, mm. even if you took something as a very current example, if you, t if you took a look at the people who are working on uh, vaccines mm. with great urgency, they're not all Brits. They come from absolutely everywhere. There are Chinese scientists in Oxford alongside Canadian scientists in Oxford. That's a very powerful group in Oxford. Mm. I mean, I just mentioned it because I was being taken through some of the virus work that they, they're doing in, in mm. uh, the last days. It's true at um, other universities as well. It's true in loads and loads of professions all the way through. We, we, we have we have behaved, I think, murderously to, to people in care homes. I, the ring of steel that should be around the most vulnerable, pe vulnerable people is actually a ring of disease around vulnerable people. Yeah. No kit, nobody even bothering to count the people who've, who've died, whatever they've contributed to this society in their past. And then you look at the staff in those homes, it's something like 80% of them are people who come from other countries. Mm. When you talk, I found this during the Brexit campaign, you know, when you talk to people and they said, oh, there's far too many immigrants. And you say, oh, what, do, you, do you not want um, people from abroad working as doctors and nurses in the health service? Oh, well, obviously, we don't mean that. And then you say, what about people who are looking after your mum or your gr granny in the care home? And they say, no, no, of course, we don't mean them. And then you get all the way through to saying, what about people picking peas in Lincolnshire? They don't mean them either. Who what they really mean is they don't like people of colour, actually. And I think that we've got to respond to that. We shouldn't let this kind of notion that um, anybody, anybody and anything 
that comes from outside is dangerous. That's Trump territory. Mm. Got a couple of questions from uh, Milad Am uh, Amini. Uh, I apologise if I haven't pronounced your name properly, Milad. Uh, but but um, yeah, I've got a couple of questions from him here. So let me just unmute you there. Uh, right, do you want to ask your questions, Milad? Thank you very much indeed. Um, I just want to say with the coronavirus outbreak, there's going to be a huge um, policy platform for um, the Labour movement in terms of uh, protecting uh, employment rights moving forward because it shows how vulnerable um, people's jobs are. And actually, um, it really goes to show how vital some of the people who the Conservative Party have described as unskilled workers are in keeping our society running for example delivery drivers shelf staffers in our supermarkets you know people that are on very very poor conditions of pay and workers rights so um i guess my first question is what role do you think the labor party and the labor movement generally with trade unions and all that sort of stuff will have in um rebuilding the um the employment rights for for such workers um, and my second question really is um, just, it's not to do with the future of the Labour Party, but actually the House of Lords. Um, I just wonder how the House of Lords is uh, conducting its business in holding the government to account during the um, lockdown period and a period where we're going to be seeing a sort of a virtual parliament to some degree. Thank you. Ooh. Well, the, the, the second one, um let me try and deal with that one very quickly. Today was the first virtual sitting. Uh, rather like the beginning of this session, it was murder to get into. <laughs> <laughs> and the wrong technologies were, not, not that we were, tonight we're using the wrong technologies, but the wrong technologies were being used. Uh, but after, after it warmed up a bit, it uh, did begin to uh, sound rather more sort of serious. And I did think that there were a number of questions that were being asked uh, that were useful. Uh, I just think that the more channels in politics that are open at the moment to ask questions through the better because in a way the government's got away with a huge amount by not being subject to any serious scrutiny in this period and I think Milad that's probably in, in it, part of your question implied that and I agree with that very strongly. On employment rights I was thinking very hard about the election which I had a real role in um, in strategic terms in in 2001 uh, between 2000 sorry between 97 and 2001 and then a bit more after 2001 there were a, a lot of discussions about different employment rights because people working in very different ways to the ways they had worked traditionally and of course it's moved on with the gig economy massively since then but the first signs of it were around then that's I suppose what I would say and if we haven't learned that those people are fundamental to all kinds of things that we need in our society, whether it's food being stacked in a supermarket or being delivered to us because we can't go out, whatever it is, these are, I don't know what the definition of a key worker really is anymore. All I know is there are a lot of people out there keeping me and my family alive and in, you know, decent conditions. And my thanks go to the very profound way. But profound thanks isn't half so good as having profound employment rights. And I think that one of the things that we can do now as a party, and that's why I said, you know, revisit the, the concepts of what is fair, what would be regarded by everybody as being a just way of dealing with it. We've got the arguments for justice absolutely now, and we will have them for some time to come, and we would be fools not to use them. Fools because we would let people down and fools because it's a way back to being a government that can do something for them rather than complain on the sidelines. Absolutely. Um, I suppose uh, also on the subject of, of fairness and you know not just general thanks for key workers, um, but something that I've seen going around particularly on social media recently is um, the notion of how the Conservatives voted against quite recently in the scheme of things a pay rise for various nurses. And um, yeah, and you know that really Labour ought to be championing much more strongly that they're well overdue a pay rise, and that a lot of our key workers are well overdue some sort of pay rise. You know, it 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 sometimes absolutely amazes me. If you go back to, I'm sorry to keep going back, but you know, there's lessons to be learned. Uh, if you go back to the uh, Attlee government and the period uh, after the Second World War 
for quite a lot of, of workers, uh, they didn't really negotiate their pay in the way that happens now. They were, um, they were pay reviewed mm. and their pay moved usually in relation to people who were doing reasonably well in the economy. They were regarded as being as important. That was true of um, the police. It was true uh, to some extent of teachers, although that was always a rather more fluid system. It was certainly true of nurses, doctors, a whole lot of civil servants. Not, not least, they made sure they were uh, well embedded in this, of course, and they were right. What we had was uh, a system which was transparent, was fair, was nothing to do with industrial muscle. Now, I'm not against people on occasions feeling that they've got to exert their power as workers. I mean, goodness knows I'm not against that. But it's a ludicrous way of dealing with people like nurses who will go to any length pretty much not to harm the people they're looking after i remember when i was the general secretary of the university teachers having a discussion with a conservative minister for higher education and i was saying we've got very fed up our pension systems in tatters we i mean there was a list of things that i was angry about and he said don't tell me you're going to do anything about it i know academics they love their research even more than they, they like teaching they love their research. They'll eat the bark off the trees if they really get uh, pushed. And I thought, now there's, there's a model in someone's head. The truth is that a lot of people do things because they've got huge vocational pride and uh, a sense of what they're doing for the people that they're working with, whether it's kids in schools or patients in hospitals or whatever. And the idea that they've got to go through something which is a, a, a bitter struggle just to get paid properly mm. is crackers and i can't really think why we don't say uh clem Attlee got this right mm. you know, and 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 night bevan i mean we're not talking about people who were um simply trying to blunt the impact of the unions they mm. were people who wanted fairness mm. absolutely uh i think we've got a question from abdi so if we can go to abdi uh, right, your mic is unmuted, Abdi. Off you go. Uh, cheers, Henry, uh, and, and thank you, uh, Lord Treasurer, for that for that very insightful talk. Just just quickly, um, from your experience being a Labour member since you were age of age of fifteen, um, what would you say was your proudest achievement or moment in the Labour Party? Um, and another question: I know you're you're a big football fan, and unfortunately a Spurs fan because I'm a Gooner. Um, <laughs> But how do you see the, um, the, 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 this season's Premier League continuing, um, bearing in mind next year there are the, Euro, the Euros have been pushed back to next year, but as well as the um, qualifications for the 2022 World Cup? God, that's the thing about Gunas. They always ask you the hardest question of the life. <laughs> let, me, let me just tell you, one of the people I've been um, in touch with all the way through this pandemic has been uh, Ivan Gazidis, who was the... CEO of uh, of the Arsenal, a very, very good friend, and he's kind of locked up in Milan because he's at AC Milan now. I tell you, sometimes people um, um, move to things which they think are going to be fabulous and turn out to be quite dangerous. Proudest moments in the Labour Party, I think, have been um, the, for me, in a direct sense, have been the historic wins in elections which meant we could do things like the statutory minimum wage um, family support that uh, there were a whole raft of things that we could do and and having a real involvement in those electoral successes have been very important funnily enough as a minister and i spent a lot of my ministerial time well you've heard i spent some of it in higher education but a lot of my ministerial time in the foreign office and one of the places that i was um, responsible for geographically was africa and i was very 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 proud very honored to have that opportunity i think that the uh, 2005 debt forgiveness um uh, thing the, the the make poverty history g8 meeting which i was at and uh, took part in was something which i was very very pleased to have the opportunity to do and one or two other things in Africa, mostly when you try and resolve a war, you fail. I mean, I'd love to say the opposite, but the truth is you don't succeed. Um, but I was able to uh, get a piece at one stage in a very troubled negotiation with 
lots of people uh, potentially dying all around uh, between Eritrea and Ethiopia. And I thought the last time they went to war, I think over 2 million people died. And there are moments when you think, well, these may be rare occasions that you get a result, but they're great results to get. On what will happen with the Premier League, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, I think they will try to finish it. I hope that they will be seriously attentive to the issues of uh, large numbers of people coming together and also the health of uh, the players and, and the people who would need to be there even behind closed doors. The things that have been said by some people in football, uh, I, I think are, uh, are commendable. Footballs, I love football, but it's a sport. No one should die because of it. Thank you very much. Um, right, we've got a question, I believe, from Leon next. So if we can go to Leon. Yep, hi Leon. Um, so the question I wanted to ask was picking up on what you said about uh, party professionalisation and also in light of the recent report that com has come out. Uh, what would you think of the idea of uh, essentially treating Labour Party staff also civil servants in the sense of sort of earth like, how they can express their political views and are subject to sort of sit, like a, a more rigorous assessment for sort of moving up the ranks within the party and um, so sort of rather than sort of being appointed on sort of a political basis and sort of allowing some of the sort of more, more extreme behaviours we've seen or, or had alleged in the report. One of the things I thought was really really important to um, maintain when I went to work for the party as general secretary was that you couldn't in the party uh, machinery in my view have sectarianism. I didn't want people having a view about um, Gordon Brown and Tony Blair every five minutes because the newspapers did. I didn't want those kinds of and that was in a way you know one of the sectarianisms of its time. I, I didn't want that. We had to serve the party we had to serve and preserve a government because we were the government. We were able to do a lot of stuff because we were the government. So I think having, um, ha having a structure which is led properly, which is anti-sectarian, is, um, is very important. But I ought to add one caveat to that uh, in order to be really very honest about my position. What I also couldn't abide was people who were interests from other political organizations coming in and disrupting us inside so I would be I'd have to plead guilty to having expelled um, uh, George Galloway and uh, Ken Livingston and a load of people from the militant tendency because that was in my view uh, another political party as it happens a Trotskyist one who were trying to uh, who, who were trying to live like parasites inside the body of the Labour Party no sectarianism within Labour, but no entryism into Labour in order to try and steal it or corrupt it. Uh, thank you very much. I think we've got one more question from Matthew, um, but I should just say uh, to everyone else uh, as well that if you would like to ask um, any other questions, then please do uh, drop us a message on the chat. Matthew? How will the coronavirus impact negotiation of a trade deal with you in regards to free trade and the uh, speed of the negotiations? Well, well enormously. Um, the, the chances of there being a proper negotiation, even if both parties wanted a proper negotiation, I rate as close to zero. Uh, I did, um, when I was in the Foreign Office, I did a certain amount of uh, negotiating and, uh, and I also was there when we held the presidency of the EU. It's a long time ago now, in 2005, but we, we did a lot of the work uh, because we had the presidency of the EU. And I know just how hard it is to do those negotiations. They're very, very intricate. There's always lots of different small factors that become obsessively big in some people's minds. But at the moment, the government's statement that it's not going to go beyond the end of this year, I think would be madness. This the virus has hit us enormously economically, that's obvious. The idea of just leaving the EU because we've got some sort of crazy ideology about Europe will, if anything, make it 10 times worse. And I do mean, literally mean 
10 times worse. I don't mean a bit worse. It will be, it will be utterly catastrophic. So I don't think they can conduct negotiations. I think the EU will ask us to uh, delay the end date that we've set. And if our government's got any sense, which I'm not sure it does, but if it's got any sense, I think it will accept that and say, beyond to everybody who feels we've got to go immediately, they'll say, look, there's some things that are just beyond our control. Let's not wreck our country for a, a long period to come. A free trade agreement is probably the most complex of all trade agreements. So it's not just that we've got to get an agreement, but we've got to get the most complex agreement. I, I, ought to, I ought to acknowledge here that I was involved in a very long uh, negotiation with Brazil. And uh, the only bit of it where we finally ended up with an agreement was about music. Um, all of the rest of it, aircraft manufacturer rep never ever saw the light of day it's tough thank you very much um, well, i think that um that's possibly the end of the questions that we have here um is there anything that you would like to say to, uh, david before we start to wrap up well uh, you know I've, I've said that i've just got one or two more tests which i'd, I'd like to see Kia address they're not tests in the same sense as an examination question, but they're things I think have got to be addressed. But my spirit is um, hugely higher than it's been at any time uh, in the recent past. And the key reasons are for the first time in a long time, I think among us, we've got the potential to form a government and to represent the people we're supposed to represent, and many others who we don't always think of representing, but should represent, because a government's a government of all the people of a country, not just the people who, who vote for it or who, who like it. And uh, I would just say to everybody that, you know, whether you're relatively new in politics, I mean, Matthew uh, appeared to me to be relatively new in politics. I'm very, very old in politics. Uh, the people like you and Miladnath in, in between, but but all of us, I think, have now got an opportunity, and let's take that opportunity by saying, what's the conversation that people want with us? What will make them give us permission to have that conversation, to understand what they need, and then to work out the fair, just equitable and aspirational ways to do it. Thank you very much for that, David. I think I might just ask one or two uh, very quick fire questions, just as we've got, I think, about five minutes left. So one is, you know, you've expressed a lot of positivity but just now about, you know, your sense of where we are with the Labour Party, now more positivity that you've had for some time. So I'd like to ask what sort of positive things, if you like, have you seen come out of the way that, you know, the country, if not the government, but the country as a whole has been responding to this virus and that you think will be helpful going forward for us as a country and you know, positive for us. And the other thing is perhaps if you happen to have any fun anecdotes that you could share with us from your time as General Secretary of the party or at any other point during your political career. Well, <laughs> uh, that last one's very tempting. Um, the, the, <laughs> The first thing is that I think that we've responded in a very measured and sensible way to the crisis and whatever analysis is done in the long term, we've got to get out of this and we've got to get out of it with as few people dying and with as few NHS staff being um, compromised and dying as we, as we can. But I think we do, and it was a good question earlier about um, holding people to account, we've got to really do that because if we don't do that, then some of the stuff, some of the fictions about what we're supposed to be doing or doing to uh, help protect people will turn out to be not just lies, but lies that cost lives. And that, that is, to me, completely intolerable. So we've got to press those things. So I think that we can be seen as people who are uh, respectful of the realities, not trying just to make waves for the sake of it, but also people who are saying, the life and, um, and, and safety of the people of the United Kingdom and the people who serve them in these extreme circumstances are central. 
incidentally i believe if we do that properly it will probably mean for the party that there'll be a much better understanding of the role of the armed forces as well because we on on occasions ask them to do extraordinary things and and we should you know we, we shouldn't behind uh, behind their backs say oh actually we don't like any of this kind of stuff at all mm. so i think i think that is one of the things that makes me feel positive because i think Keir is handling it very well um they're gonna have to get away a bit from the detail to some of the broader principles involved but i think they're doing it very well i don't know quite um what uh, anecdotes i dare share <laughs> um i mean i i can tell you that uh it's very funny being in the middle of an election when a very very prominent politician <laughs> comes through and says i think i've just lost the election i've thumped a bloke in real <laughs> I'd, I'm sure most of us know who you're referring to. <laughs> no, you couldn't possibly. <laughs> anyway, so, and at that moment, you say, where are you? Know, where are you? And I'm in a small Methodist chapel, and you say, stay there whilst we figure it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know what was going to happen next. But funnily enough, my godson, who was a student in Newcastle at the time and had found the election incredibly boring, phoned me and said, "I've long last, I've got a reason to go out and campaign. <laughs> I want to... I want to campaign for people who thump people in real. I thought, I thought life's a very strange beast, but that's as good a reason as any. I mean, but there are a lot of things, you know, I, I, I can think of so many things um, in football. When I first arrived uh, as chairman of the FA, very, very quickly, I was at a meeting of FIFA and the Football Association, it's not the English Football yeah. Association, but the Football, because it was the first, so it was allowed to keep the title of the Football Association. I was automatically expected to be at this meeting, and I was there. And I, I'd been in the room about 15 minutes, and I realised that the people sitting around the room weren't the football family, but they were a mafia family. <laughs> I, was, I was in the middle of a gang of absolute crooks. And... <laughs> And what they couldn't, and they talked very openly about what they were doing. And what they couldn't understand was that anybody who'd had the good luck to arrive among them wouldn't want to steal at the same rate that they did. So I, I found myself almost from the outset um, deciding I, I, if I'd ever met any of these people in other walks of life, I'd have crossed the road and walked on the opposite pavement. And, uh, and that became, I'm afraid, a motif of my period in football. I don't know what it did for English football, but um, I hope it did something for my sanity. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for that, David. And thank you very much for agreeing to be a part of this with us tonight and for being with us on this event. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties that we had at the beginning, um, but, but this has been perfect. We've actually finished exactly on time, despite those difficulties. Um, so thank you very much to David Treesman for joining us tonight. Um, thank you very much to all of you for joining us tonight. Yeah, if you would like to um, check us out with the Young Fabians BAME Advocacy Group, uh, we exist to champion representation for BAME people within the Labour Party um, and within the Fabian Society and the Young Fabians. Uh, so please do check us out for any other Zoom events and things that we'll be doing uh, in the coming weeks. Other than that, yes, thank you all for coming. Thank you, David. Uh, you can find both David and the Young Fabians BAME Advocacy Group on Twitter. And you can find the Young Fabians BAME Advocacy Group specifically on Facebook as well. Uh, so just search for us there and like us and follow us, etc. Uh, but yes, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, we shall see you soon. Thank you, Henry. Take thank care. Thank you, David. Take care. Take, Take care, care everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.